Hey everybody, this is Vince Gilligan, uh, one of the executive producers of Better Call Saul, and uh, we are here doing the audio commentary. And this is Peter Gould, uh, one of the other executive producers on Better Call Saul. Uh, hi, this is Diane Mercer, I'm the producer. I am Ann Cherkis, I wrote the episode. And this is John Scheiben, I directed the episode. This episode is 205, it's called Rebecca. And there's electricity in this place. How weird is that? Well, this is the first time, uh, I think this is the first time ever this set has been, uh, well, certainly it's had electric lighting before, but not, not uh, practical, not the practical stuff. This, uh, this is uh, a little different here. And, of course, it has, uh, this being a flashback, this has our, uh, our bluish, crunchy look. Uh, which help hopefully cues the audience into understanding that uh, that we're seeing something from the past. That shot we just passed, which is framing within a frame, which uh, you'll see a lot more of that as we go forward, and it's just a way to really draw the eye to something. And I just love that family portrait of the two of them. That was awesome, Arthur Albert. Uh, uh, so you talked to him about the. I love that framing. I love all the framing. You did a great job with this. I should mention at this point that John Scheiben and I have known each other for a great many years. We worked together in the X-Files. Indeed. You wrote and produced, and uh, you directed uh, uh, episodes or one episode of that. Uh, yes, one episode of that. And did a great an episode of Breaking Bad that we did together. Of course. Yes. John John broke the uh, the writer's room barrier on Breaking Bad. <laughs> That's and, right. That's right. It was the first writer to direct, other than you, Vince, of course. And that was what uh, opened the floodgates. So... <laughs> so I saw, hey, this is a pretty good deal, and so I wanted to direct too. And and thank you for uh, thank you for letting me do that, Vince. You're well, thank you both. You guys for doing such a great job. Your your episode of Breaking Bad that you directed kicked ass. Uh, it really John. did. And uh, this one, I love this one too. And this is the wonderful Ann Cusack uh, playing Rebecca. How about the old Carol Burnett thing? Oh, where she pulls her earlobe. Yeah, exactly. You do this, and I'll say I have briefs to read, and we'll get rid of them. All right, whatever you want. You know why she did that, Carol Burnett? It's a great story. It was a signal to her grandmother, who had raised her. She... Seriously? He's early. You're a doll. Mm. So, Ann, uh, what was it like? Is it, this was your first episode of uh, your first episode you've written for us for Better Call Saul. Did you have fun? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, seeing this come to life, being on set with these amazing actors was uh, was an experience of a lifetime. This, and, um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I wanted, this is exterior at the actual house, and this was the first thing we shot. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the shot here? This shot here yeah. was cool. the first. It was the, the night end before. of Adam Bernstein's episode. Oh, right. Okay. And we started, he turned over the crew at about 11 p.m., and we did exteriors of this scene we ran it a couple times it's always very tense when one director has to turn the set over to the other it, it, because it, yeah. uh, there's a question of time and everybody wants the best for their episode but and everybody wants to go home and it's <laughs> yeah. like, here you are saying okay we're starting new but the you, i just the set is so amazing and this is on stage right right and it, it just gave so many opportunities but it matched so well with the exterior chuck crazy talented one mm. that and of course, this is the brilliant Tony Fanning's set. It is the largest set on our stage, and it's a set that has so many wonderful angles. I mean, it's it, one one of the we're on the set an awful lot, and it looks different in every episode. We see different sides of it in every episode, and it's uh, that's to me that's one of the signs of something that's just really beautifully designed. And, and Tony and and his great crew had to turn this thing around pretty quick because. You know, you've seen it in a great many episodes with the wires hanging out of the ceiling and all that, and they had to put all the wiring back in. They had to, to make it look like, uh, it, you know, the place was not lived in by someone who's allergic to electricity. Hey, hey Diane, why, could you tell us a little bit about how uh, this look is put on the, the show? Obviously, this scene looks different from the regular scenes on the show. Uh, how, how is that done? Um, this all happens in post. I mean, we shoot, you know, now in, on Breaking Bad, we shot 35. So uh, our our dailies color was to some degree baked in and we had to move forward from that once we got into post. But now that we're in the digital realm, um, this 
we start from ground zero when we go into our final color. So we have one look on the dailies, and we kind of live with that. But we always knew that we wanted. We've kind of set this this pattern of using the bleach bypass look to tell for the flashbacks to just help the audience kind of figure out where we are in time. So we we d we did this over a couple of days. I think we we brought you guys down to the color bay, and we chose uh, a look that we thought was you know, would play up the fact that there's electricity in this house um, and also be consistent with our with our look when we're in the past and, you know, be as flattering as we could to these actors. And uh, then our colorist goes through and makes sure everything matches and tries to make everything look, you know, consistent and, and, and pretty. And, um, and, and it, it's really a storytelling device. That's the most important thing. You know, I don't think we would necessarily have chosen this look if it wasn't to help us figure out when we were in time. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it really does help, I think, when you're trying to watch the story and understand the story. And do you want to talk a little about the, uh, uh, I don't think these two gentlemen would mind, there's a little bit of right. dig dig digital magic done to bring uh, on, on uh, Bob Odenkirk and Michael McKeon here to, to, to bring them uh, eight or ten years uh, there, younger? There is, yeah. And um, it, it's, I think... I don't know if people really know that that we do that because we try to make it as invisible as possible. But every single shot in here of Chuck every single or Jimmy, every single shot in this, in this entire teaser has just a little bit of – it's basically a virtual – Plastic surgery yeah. is kind of how we we think of it. You know, we kind of lift their eyes a little bit. Sometimes we do some work on the forehead as well, just to make them look. You know, because we're trying to sell this as ten years, ten years. earlier, yeah. um, and so, but we don't want it to look distracting and weird. So we we try to kind of strike a balance of making it look as real as possible, and. Um, and and yet really show that these guys are younger. And they of course they sell it with their performances. That's really the number one thing. Because Bob is. really feels younger the way he's performing mm -hmm. the scene. Absolutely. Um, and then we just help it help it along a little bit. And we have two can great follow, artists. Can you follow me around and do that too? I, know, <laughs> I was right? just gonna I make the same so joke. Much, <laughs> I, I want that so it. much. <laughs> Take, and tell, talk about the two artists. These guys are uh, geniuses. Yeah, we have uh, Jay Segimoto and uh, Brian Conlin, who are two artists that work opposing shifts at our post house. Keep me posted. Posted. And uh, they kind of developed this look last season when we did a couple of flashbacks, and we were really happy with it, what they did. So they kind of split the scenes and split the shots, and um, and they the two of them did every one of these. And, and you know, when we talk about things that are done digitally, I, I think there can be the feeling that it's a matter of pushing a button and then suddenly they get younger or pushing a button and then things change. The truth is the digital side of it is just a tool and these guys are artists yeah. and it's because they are so subtle and there's a, there's, you can go too far. I'm not going to mention no, any examples, but I've seen it, people going too far and actually on altering other shows. on other, other shows yeah. and other movies yeah. where they actually start altering the performance and it doesn't feel natural. And these guys, uh, key into the performance and keep it very natural. And I, I just couldn't be but happier it is, with their work. And it is not a button you push. They're doing it frame by frame. Yeah, it's I mean, frame by frame. Geniuses. It's very, very, uh, it's very painstaking. Yeah. Um, I have to ask on this um, bedroom scene. I saw a later episode of season of this season. <laughs> Was that on purpose that Kim and Jimmy in bed felt so much like this it, it did occur to me yes because that, that was peter's episode that was i did direct i, I did direct it. that episode nice. that was really yes. nice nice yeah. nice callback oh, oh, oh i like it and Ann cusack i gotta say i'm sorry i never met her i, I it's embarrassing how few actors i meet on this show because they fly straight to albuquerque 800 miles away i never even met the the woman she did a wonderful wonderful job she is such a good actress and that's such a, that's Oh, I beautiful. love that shot. Yeah, Great that's shot. A beautiful beautiful shot. shot. Arthur, Arthur uh, uh, sweated over that one. He was like, pools of light, pools of light. They pools want pools of light. Of light. <laughs> <laughs> How am I supposed to do pools of light? The lights are over here on the well, side. It was a thing. So they actually yeah. mounted lights in the ceiling mm -hmm. right over their heads oh. to make individual pools for the two nice. oh. actors. Oh, right. it. It's their entire marriage in one mm -hmm. tableau. You know? It is. This is another set. This is another amazing set. Uh, uh, the uh, Davis and Main set that uh, Tony Fanning and his crew uh, came up with for us. And it is just 
It's just, I, I want that office in oh, real life, you know? What I, mean, I want to live Who there. has a fireplace in their office? I yeah. want one. I want no, a fireplace. Yeah. Too. Well, that's a great line coming up in your yes. episode, in this yes. episode here. Uh, I'd kill for a fireplace. I something that could help get you out of there. I'm going to make things right. I also remember we really, um, would you? you, Vince, I think we're very specific about that Jimmy should be, couldn't really type that well, that he had to hunt and peck. Uh. Oh, and the two finger method. And yeah. on set, Bob wanted to actually type. Oh. And I, I, I believe I had to say to him, "No, actually, you're oh. not. Uh, Jimmy McGill Sorry, cannot type." Did you just say, "Shut up, me puppet"? <laughs> <laughs> acty. Acty. Yeah. Hey, acty. Shut up and stop talking. And I don't think it's giving away too much to say that uh, we're doing these commentaries a little bit out of order but uh of course this is jesse ennis uh and she is she is so funny in this episode and one of the one of the interesting sidelights is that bob has known jesse since she was a child because she is john ennis's daughter and john ennis uh was one of the regulars on mr show yes and so these these two have known they, these two have a long history together that's that's not why Jesse was cast. She was cast because she was just <laughs> she was the best. She was the best. But it, it was it was real. What did did these two, did they relate to each other? As, uh, oh yeah, it was really wonderful to see them. I you may remember that too, John. Just that it was like this nice reunion, and that they actually got to act. Across, you know, opposite each other. It was you could tell. Yeah. No, but they, what was great is they they the tension between them was always there. The minute we started rolling, uh -huh. it was like they were not friends anymore. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I love it. Hey, I was uh, uh, I interrupted your story with my dumb joke a minute ago. But uh, what do you do in a moment like that where the actor has one thought about, like, the typing speed right. and, and you have another? Well, in this case, I do remember when we talked about it while we were breaking the episode that you – you said I really want him to be a hunt, to hunt and peck. Yeah. And so I just, you know, again, having been in the room, I just said to him, look, that's, you know, we discussed it, and that's what Vince and Peter wanted. Well, and, and it's interesting, and thank you for, for looking out for us. Of course. And it's, it's an interesting thing because uh, I've been in those situations where the actor's right. And, yes. uh, and, and the truth is, you know, they always, and they always should be. And thank you again. Thanks for looking out for our... Well, and, but, but sometimes we're wrong. So, yeah, yeah, and Bob, you know, could have very well said to me, well, I disagree, and then, you know, I don't actually know what we would I would have done. But, um, you know, he was very accommodating, as he usually guy. is, and, and I and think it works actor. great. Yeah. There's, a, there's a lot of give and take. There is. This whole job is all about give and take. Yeah. No, it's truly a collaboration. I mean, the, these actors are keepers of their characters mm -hmm. and, and they're very passionate about it and so you have to respect that and uh and oftentimes i'll i'll do a couple takes just for them if they want to try something and you, nine times out of ten they say no that didn't work i liked it the you know the way it was scripted yeah this again beautiful set there's an outdoors so i said let's use it yeah <laughs> yeah go outdoors that, that's so nice. great this is this a special lens you're using here uh no it was really just uh 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 a telephoto long lens that oh. they just had mounted really high and used it for uh and we we got all we got almost 90 percent of our inserts that's something that that uh, uh dps and and operators take pride in we got we got our inserts as we got our shots that so we, is oh, amazing. That's amazing. That's for most oh. the people listening who don't work in the business are like i don't know what that means i don't care that is amazing because the inserts are usually what you that's your uh, leader. first thing and to get dropped on the first day. thing to get dropped <laughs> A close up of a piece of paper, you get that in another day with another crew. And, and the thing is, it, it might feel like it's inconsequential about whether uh, it's it's really the actor doing the action. But the funny thing is, is that uh, the uh, someone uh, Ray Seahorn acts with with she can act without being present. She can act yes. just using an overliner. She will use the overliner differently from just a member of the crew who's trying to who's trying to do the shot. So. It, it makes it makes a difference, and you can feel it. It's easier to cut, actually, uh, if if the A unit has has done some of this stuff. So, in other words, that's really her her hand. That's really her with hand the, with the highlighter there. Yeah. Now you see this gap in between the two tables there. Yeah. That was a, a big discussion of, of, uh, about that gap. Oh yeah, really? Because w one thing you have to do when you have a new set, and uh, you do blocking, and you bring your actors in, and you walk around it, and it was 
problematic to have uh, actors on different sides of the table because they had to go all the way around to the end. The tables were together. There was right, no gap. Right, right. So yeah. we came up with the idea, can we, can we get a second? Can we break this in half? And it was like, perfect. Nice. That way we can move the camera back and forth across the room. They can cross there. It makes it more interesting. It also makes it easier just blocking. That that's smart. That's interesting because, of course, I think we did see the set in the previous, previous episode. And so it'll be interesting to look at that and see if, if, that's, if this break between the tables was introduced. It, it is yeah, because I Adam, it. I, I said, I think I need a break. And they called Adam Bernstein over who was still shooting. I wasn't prepping. And I said, he hadn't shot it yet. And he, he looked at it and we talked about it. And he said, yeah, that's great. Let's put a break in there. That this was, is that was mis- smart. That was smart talking to him in advance. That's and you great. know, so much of uh, directing is thinking ahead and being able to 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 see around corners. And that's a great example, John. Just to to really think through what you're going to shoot and ask for things early. That's a great point. Yes. And it, it's a lot of times people tell you, "Nah, directing's about thinking on your feet and rolling with the punches." And that's true. But the best thing you can do for yourself as a director is to think ahead and to try to be a chess player. Think as far ahead as you can. You're, you're still going to have to roll with the punches. Punches are always going to come. But the more you can plot out in advance, like John was just talking about, the better. The scene is really was really interesting. It was it was a struggle. Um, both actors felt they wanted to get something more than just Kim rejects Jimmy's idea out of it. And we rehearsed it and we worked on it. And Bob came up with this and it's very subtle but if you watch it at the end when she turns on him and says i saved me his his reaction is almost pride in her like almost like wow you're and and it's very subtle but i really like it it makes a quite a difference than just i've been rejected yeah I, that's a, that's a great point to me this is and tell me if you agree and this is a pivotal scene uh, in the relationship and in some ways in the season and maybe in the series because she has great affection for Jimmy, but she's also independent. She wants to be captain of her own ship. And, and, and like you say, John, he, he respects that, although he may not always honor it. Right. What, what do you, Andy, you want to, because this says well, you have some of the best dialogue. I, I just love some of the dialogue This is one of my favorite here. scenes we've yes, ever me done. Too. <laughs> I mean, when, when I wrote it, um, I mean, I had no way of knowing that it really did end up being kind of the theme of... Well, it really ended up embodying her entire character this season. It really did. You know, and, you don't save me, I save me. Right. It's a great line. And that, you know, wasn't my intention. I mean, it should, probably should have been, but, you know, I was just writing the scene. Actually, it shouldn't have been because yeah. the great, those, those great themes, those great, if you plan them in advance, they're That's just, true. It's, it's not going to. It doesn't feel organic, maybe. I mean, I, I remember uh, my, I was working with Michael Mann years ago, and I said, what's the theme of this thing we're mm. working on? What's the, what's the moral? What's the point? And he just said, just tell the story. Right. <laughs> the, the, the moral, yeah. the theme, all that stuff yeah. will find itself later. And, and, and maybe it's not even for you to say. Right. No, it's absolutely. For you to discover. And it was, it was after the fact, after people saw it, that, you know, they picked that out. Yeah. That line. And um, obviously. What's, re- what's really interesting about this script, honestly, and what the actors, I think, really responded to was it's not um it's really not jimmy's story it's really I, we talked about it i thought of it as sort of the forrest gump of the episodes in that jimmy is going into kim's world jimmy is going into chuck's world jimmy is going into aaron's world and he's reacting and that's it's a very tough thing to act not being the one who's driving it but i thought he did a brilliant job of it but it's it's very interesting from a storytelling standpoint no, it's a good point. And, and Bob is Bob is a generous actor. He's somebody. He he's not he's not the guy who's counting how many scenes he's in no. or is subtly trying to manipulate things around so everything's about him. He he's really interested in, in helping and in telling the story. And he is a storyteller in this. Mm-hmm. And then this of this of course is the beginning. John, I, I think number you, one. I think montage you're a montage one. specialist. <laughs> I, somehow I've become bad. that. Yeah, yeah. You, you kicked but, ass on both really. these. Uh, both I, I had to give credit on uh, this first montage where it's due to uh, Kelly Dixon, yeah. whose oh, yeah. idea it was, which I thought was absolutely brilliant, to take her dialogue and uh, cut it such that it's over images that don't match. Right. So it really, it's it's truly an, an, a montage in an Eisenstein <laughs> manner, or whatever. So in other words, her you hear her talking, but her lips aren't moving. 
and, exactly. and, and vice versa. And you're, and you're getting the emotion on her face. You're getting the defeat. You're getting the frustration. That's flattering. Yeah. Because it's not important what she's saying. What's important is her emotion yeah. and what it's telling us about her. Yeah. Beautifully done. Kelly really is. Uh, uh, she has come up with so many ideas on, on Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad before that. As has as has uh, Skip McDonald, our other wonderful editor. They just stuff that they'll they'll show me in the editing room. They'll show us, and I'm just like, man, I would have never thought of that. Yeah. I love that. That's happened to me all the time. Yeah, this this season, I think especially, uh, this has been a montage heavy season for whatever reason, and I, I really think uh, Kelly and uh, Chris McCaleb and Curtis Thurber have outdone themselves. Absolutely. Fun fact about those post-its. So you know, I had to come up with these names. And I, I, can't, I think I came up with about 20, 25 names. And a lot of them are friends of mine nice. or people I know. And, you know, some of them made it through clearances and some of them didn't. That's but weird. The people that did end up on those post-its were really thrilled when they saw it in the episode. <laughs> That's so good. That's I'm cool. glad. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, phone numbers are tricky, too. I mean, yes. yeah, to show a phone number. Because you don't want to do the 555 five, five thing. No. It, everyone knows instantly. It takes you out of the movie. And everyone knows it's I know. fake. Yeah. And I don't know if we will have talked about this on the episode 204 podcast, which we have not recorded yet. But again, to uh, point out, this is this too is a stage set. And it, uh, as John, you were talking about earlier, and uh, it's amazing how wonderful a job it is, how beautiful it is. I can't get Kaylee out of the pool. This is the first hotel I ever stayed at, the very first night I ever spent in Albuquerque. This oh, is really? The Hotel Blue, I believe it's called. Is that the name yes, of it? Yes, indeed. Yes. I stayed, I was on a, well, I was on the X-Files at the time, and I was on an Air Force trip. Uh, it was a, like an Air Force uh, tour of Kirtland Air Force Base that I had gotten through the largesse of Chris Carter, who was the guy who was invited, and he sent me instead because he knew I was into all That's that right, shit. That's right, I remember that. And it was awesome. And that was a hotel I stayed at, and you and you guys uh, used the pool there. I understand that was Dean Norris's favorite hotel for a while. Right. I think you're right. That's my association with a hotel, is Dean Norris. They have Tempur-Pedic beds. Oh, there you go. Apparently, that's a rare thing in hotels. All right, bye, darling. Apparently, he's into that because he likes to leave a, an impression of himself. <laughs> <laughs> now, Diane, a lot of his injury is... Uh, yeah, it's less than, it's less than you would think, actually, but it is all the eye part, like the, for this episode, for episode four, two of four, we did a lot more work than this one, because he's supposed to have healed more, uh, but yeah, the, around the forehead and the cheek is practical makeup, and then we did the eye part, just because, um, John and when you say really, you did it, explain that. Uh, sorry, it it, it's all that's again. It's more digital magic. It's just ones um, and zeros. It's really. it's yeah. all ones and zeros. It's all tracked on there. Um, you know, color matched and and all of that. And that was done by um, Bill Pulaski and his team at uh, Velocity Visuals. Nice. They they do all that that kind of three D work for us. That's awesome. So this is the wonderful Nadine Marissa. God I love bless her. her. Love her. She is so great. Amazing. If we didn't already know Francesca was coming, I would be desperate for her to oh, yeah. be yeah. Jimmy's assistant. Oh yeah. I love her. That's right. Yeah, we got to get to Francesca at some point yes, from uh, the, from the Breaking Bad. Tina's being very so. patient. She's been very so patient. Tina the Parker, the wonderful Tina Parker. We uh, have not forgotten you, Tina. That that but, uh, the bear, by the way, is known as the Prayer Bear. Oh, oh is really? It? Because it's pause are together. Oh, it's, yes, we chose the prayer bear on purpose. Nice, nice. It Excellent choice. The best. She that wants guy that owns, bear. That guy owns all of Montecito, California. I know, it's crazy. From, from those stuffed animals. Mr. Beanie Baby. Beanie, oh Beanie God. Baby. That's right. Ty, uh, um, it was fun seeing them Ty again, Warner. actually. Ty Warner. It's been such a long time. That's what you, like want. you want. They've just disappeared. You want that Beanie Baby money. Thank you, Mr. Warner, for letting us use the prayer bear. Yes. Her look, though. Because they get a say in that. They get a say in that. She is so... She's so oh great. God. You know, we end up cutting to her more because she's mm -hmm. so, so good. she's I know, so her wonderful. Her reactions, you know, that's Look not at this scripted. Right here. It's great. We'll take it. Uh, she wants that bear and she hates her. I know. Yeah, she's so yeah. good. I love the glasses too. Give me that bear. I, I feel that Aaron's going to have some trouble with her in the future. <laughs> <laughs> this is um I would love to see that. This is a this is what we call a wonder, which is and we designed it that way that it's one shot that brings around the corner and lands on her. We covered it with uh, safety yeah. shots, but uh, I love wonders. They, they they really help tell the story. You don't need to always cut. I agree, and they and they give you geography. You really I, know it's a real place too. For I me. have to say, this scene this might be. It's just one of my favorite this scenes in the so series great. so far. Yes, 
uh, it's 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 a wonderful scene, and uh, I love the fact. That, uh, story wise, I think it was so important for us that Jimmy's really got it good, and we need to acknowledge that things things are things are great. He's got everything that he that he wanted in some sense, but it's not sitting well. And here, and and you want to talk about uh, talk about this? I mean. Uh, you know, it was very fun. It was fun to write. It was great. But then to see it, you know, come alive, especially with the wonderful Peter. Peter Dyson. Dyson. Peter Dyson. Dyson this guy is so goddamn funny. Very talented. I love this guy. <laughs> and he, he gave us so much, and he did different little things on different takes and... Well, and you see this move he just made, which was something that came out of rehearsal. Because <laughs> Omar. Omar. It's, it's, Such it's a wonderful. great line reading. Oh, yeah. That's, that's vomit. vomit. And, uh, vomit. and Peter, Peter, of course, has appeared in two other episodes of uh, Better Call Saul. Back in season one, he was in the montage, that uh, Petty with a Prior montage. And I remember Bob saying, you know, this guy's really good. He's, he's a local actor in Albuquerque. <laughs> And Bob liked him, and we liked him, and so that's one of the great things about series television is uh, you see people who who you like, and if if it fits into the story, you can give them more to do. Because you guys really you you kind of wrote this for him. Yes. yes. Oh yes. Yes. I mean, once once whoever you know someone had the idea of okay, maybe this should be Oakley, Bill Oakley. I didn't. I didn't realize just how funny he was going to be, though. No, I yet didn't. another oh, yeah. actor I've never met. So yeah. God bless yes. you, Peter. Great job. Great job. And, and also thank you to uh, thank you to production for putting the uh, courthouse bathroom set back up for that one scene. Yeah, that was a set. That was, that a, was set a set from set. from the pilot. Very realistic. That, that set. I yeah. don't think we've seen since maybe episode three of season one. So it was sitting there on the the scene dock. And now here's John. Here you go. And this here's, is this was your. Musical selection, wasn't it? Yes, indeed. I found this, and I would never thought we could get it. And thanks to Thomas Goyevic and company, and you guys for getting it. Doing this montage was great, but we, we had to, production-wise, we didn't have a lot of time, but you have to get all this footage. So we basically broke it up into four different sets and four different wardrobe looks and ran poor Ray around. We'd shoot in one set. We shoot the next set. We shoot in the conference room, in the bathroom, and then we she change. Then we go down to the rain. And the and rain was do, fake. Right? And the rain was fake. I mean, it was real water. Rain was, was right outside the, those yeah. windows yeah. there. Yeah. Wow. Um, and they put rain towers all on the top of that building, right. which which we've never done before. Never done before. Yeah. Yeah. We used to do it all the time on the X Files way back. When, yeah. But not now. Was this an entire day, or was this more no? Than this a was day? less than half a day. Less Jesus, than half a day. seriously? Less than half a day. That's amazing. It Holy was like shit! Film school. We were running and gunning. Oh my <laughs> god! Were and by the way, I got to point out before we get too far past it, that is a real bathroom she was in, and it has floor-to-ceiling windows. And yes. I don't know who the fuck designs a bathroom <laughs> with floor-to-ceiling. I know, windows. but it's gorgeous. <laughs> That's a real place. In case you're saying, I why, used why are there windows? Yeah, it looks like a conceit. It's like insane. But uh, uh, this this montage is so great. Gypsy Kings, got to give a shout out to the song uh, yes. that, that you said that you found for us. A mi manera, uh, my way, obviously, uh, uh, in Spanish. The, 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 of course, best known as the Frank Sinatra head. Yeah. And I like the Gypsy Kings version better, better though, I got to say. Yeah. So the, this was this a great call. Just... Uh, great. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, because we, 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 we looked at other things for this, yeah, many. this, this moment. But this just had this great emotion and drive to it that it worked better than anything else we put here. Yeah, great you know? choice. Yeah, I love this shot, by mm -hmm. the way, looking down the stairwell. That's uh, so many great so many shots, great shots in here. In yeah, because I remember in the script, I had written in the description sort of the, t I want the tone, the feel of this, and it was more uh, depressing. You know, we sort of wanted it to be this grind and see her you know and you still get that you yeah do, but there's but kind of a triumph to the exactly. there it is, which i really like yeah yeah well i think it sets up howard's betrayal better that she's mm -hmm. she's working so hard yeah. and she's so passionate about it and right. then she gets a win and then boom yeah right and, and i've been very well done. lawyers have told me this is uh in a lot of ways the most realistic thing that we've done and the most realistic mm -hmm. uh view of big law i don't know whether that's true or not all if that's true i'm sorry for those of you working in big law i know this, yeah but that's it should be said that's the document review room the doc review room and that's 
And that is a big part of big law that you see, or probably any law where you got to review really? documents, and it just sounds like hell on earth. Well, after my father, uh, great shot. This is, I love this. Said, love this. told this is, me that he liked. He said it was authentic. It was a little too nice, though. <laughs> oh, a little too nice. Okay. Well, apparently they do a lot of it on computers now. But mm -hmm. keep keep in mind, lawyers, what listening to this? This is 2002. Thank you. Right. Pace. So this is not. Me too. You know, this is a period piece as we as okay. we shoot this. This has uh, two of my favorite things. It's a one -er, and it also has a frame within a frame, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, um, it's such a beautiful... We, we did this several shot. times, and we did a shot to be able to cut to, but uh, the last one we did was this one, I think, and it was it, we, we had to time it so that... Because we, we knew we only could be on screen so long. Right. So it was like, go... Dance, leave. Do your happy dance quickly. Do your happy dance. <laughs> so, Here's the so uh, uh, Rain Man shot. That we oh yeah, had. yeah, right. The and, Rain Man. And, shot. and you know, you know, one thing about that is that Ray, like a lot of our cast, acts with her whole body. Yes. yes. Uh, and and if you're doing a, a show that is all big choker singles, you miss that. I mean, you look at look her at, hands. Yeah. She acts with her hands. She acts with her feet. I love the way Patrick Head says Patrick himself. Patrick does too. I know. Yes. I know. And he's oh man. Positions himself. <laughs> Yeah. And and, uh, and a ten of director will will uh, will back up a little bit and and get get that great stuff. Yeah, great great stuff. And this is Rex Lynn and Kara Pifko, Kevin and Paige. They are both wonderful actors. They do a great job, and you'll see more of them in other episodes. I, I got I was very lucky to get to direct them a little bit later, and they they're both wonderful. I think Kevin's best work is coming up in this show is coming up uh, in your episode nine. Yes, yeah. he's, he's great. He's, he does, and they're both wonderful. They both do a great job. What the heck else is money good for when you're seven years old? <laughs> Crazy bathroom aside with the plate glass uh, floor to ceiling window, this, this whole uh, 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 series of office buildings that we shoot at in Albuquerque, and this, this building is actually a separate building than the building with the... Uh, with the uh, uh, HHM uh, conference room, but it's all in one big uh, office park, and they've been very nice to us, uh, thanks to the folks who own this facility and the folks uh, uh, renting offices from it who are very understanding of us coming and coming in and uh, annoying them. Hopefully we're not annoying them too much. They're, they've been wonderful to us, and the, all this office space looks great on film. I, I love is, the fact that uh, Hamlet, Hamlet McGill, has its own flag. Well, I'm, yeah. I was going to talk about it. I'm very proud of that. That was my that idea. Was and it started as yeah. a callback, honestly, to Sunset, the episode of Breaking Bad that I directed, uh, oh, which right. had a flagpole in the of beginning. Yeah. But we were there at this also location. Mrs. And they had a flag. Mrs. house. Mrs. Peccatilla, yeah, you remember. Yeah. This was, they had a flag, and I just saw it, and I said, wouldn't HHM have a flag? I mean, the, the way that they are. And so they made a flag, which was two-sided, so that we could uh, fly it blow the wind. The wind is artificial. They had two cranes, nice. one for the camera and one for the, uh, to make the flag wave. Nice. And one uh, with a wind machine. Oh, so was this machine. artificial yeah. wind here blow, blowing right That was here. real wind. That was we, real were, wind. we had a storm coming in. But, oh, my God. <laughs> but that's We artificial. had to stop that day, actually, for lightning. When, when, when oh, they no. detect lightning nearby, they shut you down, and we sat for an hour, I think, or 45 minutes. They use a special machine to detect a lightning strike, within, and if it's within six miles, you've got to shut down. It was right? crazy. Isn't that something? Somebody yeah. should take uh, all of our discussions of lightning strikes on these, uh, on these commentaries <laughs> and just string them all together. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> because that is that is one of the salient facts of shooting Better Call Saul is the is the uh, lightning delay, especially in the summer, I guess. Yeah, in in Albuquerque. Well, when we were on Breaking Bad, we were mostly a winter shoot. Yeah, and so we weren't familiar with uh, the lightning delay. That's true. Uh, New Mexico is a beautiful, beautiful state that is uh, where nature is just primed to kill you at any second. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the way it is. You've got to be tough to live there. Oh, and Arthur Albert. Look at that. Yeah, it's beautiful. This scene is beautiful. One of your golf courses. One thing that makes it a little, little uh, different to shoot in that set is that one uh, it, Arthur uses atmosphere. He uses smoke in this location. And uh, that means sometimes uh, you have to wait for the smoke to settle a little bit. There's a little bit, a little bit of extra, a little bit of extra time, a little bit of extra effort because of the smoke. But it is worth it. It just brought back memories because we we smoked every scene on the X Files. That's right. That's right. right. Nine years. <laughs> that's right. Everything was smoke. That was Canadian smoke, though. You, you didn't <laughs> use it in seasons one through four, and then the rest of it was it Los like Angeles smoke. Syrup. Nicer, nicer smoke, yeah. more friendly. <laughs> you didn't bring you didn't bring Canadian smoke when you moved uh, when you moved back we, we, back to LA. Yeah, we probably Probably did. <laughs> did you use smoke in the teaser of this episode when when the lights were on? Yes. You did. Oh wow! 
It looks amazing. It's tricky because, like Peter saying, you got to get it just right, which means you don't want to see it swirling around in the lights. You don't want to see visible smoke. You just right. want a little haze. Which we have seen, and we have occasionally cut around or yes. fixed. Those, uh, digitally fixed, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. There are all those movies from the 80s that always look like every bar is on fire. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, you feel like the smoke alarms are about to go <laughs> off. Right. Was this uh, this supposed to be early, early morning? Was this just like uh, just after sundown in real life, or what was? Uh... It was, it was, uh, it was probably nine or ten o'clock at night, actually. Oh, okay. And uh, what's interesting is, is you know, has been said many times, morning, to play darkness, you have to actually light it. And so our, they did a terrific job of lighting this so that it looks dark. Believe it or not, this shot. This, this is, is a, a great magic. shot. Beautiful I love this shot. shot. You and Arthur, man, you guys it's, are a good team. Well, it's, it, it, you know, when I read the script immediately and I saw the location, it's like it's perfect thing for that light going away. It just uh, really worked well. And for the light geeks out there, and I'm one of them, so, uh, that, that in the old days, uh, in like an old Frankenstein movie, you'd have a spotlight following him up the, but that was practical light. That was that, pra yes, they make a special lantern that's got an LED in it, and, it, uh, and that lit the... 90% of the set. Wow. And Every once in a while we use a real lantern, but it is a fire hazard yeah. for us to carry around actual uh, actual lanterns with a flame in them. But there are, there are, of course, great scenes where they actually light them up and it looks great. Yeah. Now, the LED ones look great, too. More like late. <clears throat> Well, regardless of this scene coming up is like a master class in acting. But uh, these two Absolutely. are so damn good in this scene. Michael and Ray, they are so good. I love this scene. And great job writing it, great job directing it. This is wonderful, wonderful stuff coming up. And now this is a set. This is, uh, this is an indoor set on our soundstage. Most everything else in HHM is real practical locations in that office park. I was, the office park, by the way, which you could almost literally throw a rock from it to the very first soundstage, quote unquote, we used on the pilot of Breaking Bad. It's over off of Jefferson in, in Albuquerque, and, and it was where we shot uh, uh, the White House uh, on the pilot of Breaking Bad. It was an old warehouse. It wasn't even a soundstage, and that's within an easy walk of this of the office park in this one. Now, you should know that, that behind them, through the windows, this is a set. That's what's called a backing. It's a giant photograph basically spread around, mm -hmm. and that's of Los Angeles. And it's from, it's Mad, from Mad Men. Mad Men. Oh, it's from the, the TV show Mad News backdrop. You can see the Mad Capitol Man. Records building in it. <laughs> from, the fi from the final <laughs> we, season we, of Mad Men. We, we covered up with uh, with greens, yeah. especially yeah. Yeah. They, and, they just shipped it out to, uh, to uh, New Mexico. Yeah. yeah, luckily they didn't need it anymore. And, and, uh, and FYI, we, did. <laughs> we didn't get it cheaper just because it was another AMC show. No, no we did yeah. not. Was, we no. still had to. We still had to no. pay. That for was it. weird happenstance, yeah. honestly. Right. Well, and I mean, one of the reasons we got this one is because last season. Uh, the one we had really was Los Angeles, and it was modern Los Angeles, and it had downtown skyscrapers in it right. that we had to paint out later right. in post. So um, I, Tony, Damn I guess, mess. dug this one up, found this. Because yeah. at that time, I think Mad Men may have still been using the other one. Oh, right, right. I can't remember, but um, we got lucky. <laughs> right. There's a shot coming up here that we talked about from the tone meeting, which is this long meeting, six, seven-hour meeting that Literally. the directors have with yeah. the showrunners and the writer. And uh, I know that Peter and Vince are big fans of, as am I, of the slow zoom that Kubrick often used and other directors have used. And so we planned on doing it here. When the story starts to turn dark, we're slowly creeping in on him, telling the story, and it really just works so well. Um, I talked to Michael about it before we did it, and it, it's in, it, the problem for the actor is he's got to get all his lines. Yes. You're not cutting to anything. And he was totally down with it. In fact, we talked about the life and death of Colonel Blimp to film Geek Out for a minute. Wow. Uh, uh, Emmerich Pressburger That's and a Michael Powell one. movie, which has a long monologue that the camera just creeps in on. And uh, he, of course, knew the movie. And, uh, and we discussed that, and, then we, and he just nailed it. His own boss put everything he had into that place. I was away at college when he put Jimmy to work there. Jimmy grew up. You can see her, her position in frame is changing because we're slowly zooming. And it's he's slowly very getting subtle. larger. And, yeah. and Paul, our wonderful A camera operator, has to be zooming in. And uh, he, in this case, Paul, has to be zooming in 
he's got to know how long the scene's going to go, and he's got he can't zoom too fast, or else he'll be done with the zoom at the wrong moment. If you zoom too slow, you'll never get to where you need to go. It's a, there's a, it's a real ballet. It's a real delicate choreography here. And I love how still uh, Ray is in this scene. Uh, she has this character. Ray and, and Kim both have this incredible poker face, where you can see that she's thinking, but you can't. It's very difficult to guess what she's going to say or do, and you wait for it. And I think we talked about this. She talked about this on the podcast for this episode, but a little bit, a little tidbit worth repeating. Apparently, she surprised Michael here in that he was expecting her to be more solicitous of his character. In other words, for Kim to be more solicitous of her boss, like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, boss, yes. great. And she she did not give him that, and it surprised him, and I think it helped the scene, apparently. I agree. Yeah. He has a good heart. She makes another observation in the podcast, which is worth listening to, that a character who's not speaking is not speaking just because the character has nothing to say. They're not speaking as a choice. And you can see she's making a choice to say nothing here. And she's going to let this, she's going to let this spin out. Yeah. And what did she think of it all? It's kind of hard to say. It is hard to tell. What do you think, Anne? I think she's very skeptical what he's saying. She also feels some disdain. Well, and she's, you know, she's stuck in the middle. She has nothing to do with any of this between yeah, she's Jimmy pawn. and Chuck. And, and she's in the middle of it, and and Hamlin too. I mean, and it it's 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 a horrible position to be in. There's the bell. There's the bell. Fran. There's yeah, we had, Fran. We had Fran. quite a few debates about the bell. How much bell? Less <laughs> bell, more bell. When is the bell? Debriana Mancini plays yes. uh, Fran, the waitress. Uh, Fran, uh, named after a, a wonderful, lovely, real life woman uh, who is not a waitress, uh, but who is a good friend of Breaking Bad. Uh, who uh, is the owner of the Walter White house uh, that we shot in for so many years, shot outside of for so many years. So that was a little tip of the hat to the lovely Fran in Albuquerque. Here he is. Here's the man, and he's walking, and he's, ta and he's speaking English. This is the first scene ever on either show where he's, I believe, where he speaks English. In fact, when we first cast Mark Margolis on uh, Breaking Bad, or uh, where you first had the idea to cast him, as I recall, we were remembering him from Scarface. And, of course, he speaks only Spanish in Scarface. And we were thinking, oh, let's get this this uh, this great... You think, you think he this speaks... Great this great actor. Hispanic actor. Hispanic <laughs> actor. <laughs> and, and when we met him, he's like, guys, I'm just an old Jew from New York. I don't speak Spanish. I had to learn all that stuff phonetically. I love this guy. This was such a pleasure to direct because I didn't have to do anything. <laughs> they, they, it, they were like two boxers getting in a ring, and I just let them go. It was so fun. Talk about another master class watching. These two guys between them have, I think, quite literally 100 years of acting experience, these two, professional acting experience. I love these guys. These guys are great. I love this shot, too. I'm a big fan of profiles, to be honest, yeah. and... Uh, You'll see a couple of close-up profiles as well, which yeah. just give you something to mix it up. I it, love it, how... No, I was going to say how Mark just lifts the coffee without looking at yeah, it. Yeah, without looking at his mouth. He doesn't take his eyes off of Mike. And, and Diane, you want to talk? There's a little more digital magic here. His, uh, uh, just a little bit, yeah. We, we, I think we had to add... We were just concerned that it... it didn't look like it, it looked like too much time had just had passed. So we added just a little bit more onto his face here. A little, well. little more bruising, little more bruising. On, on Mike's face. Yeah. yeah. And also because there's the line that Hector says, "Oh, he really did a number on you." Right. Yeah. And the makeup was amazing. I mean, the 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 practical makeup really was is ninety percent of it. We just kind of you know augmented it a little bit. There wasn't was, anything wrong with the makeup. It was just so dark with this beautiful dark lighting. Yeah. You couldn't really see it. So yeah. you had to amp it right. up digitally. Yeah, that was really on us because I think on the story clock, oh, more time has passed. If you if you were to break it out, I but think it was it about felt, two weeks. Yeah, it, 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 but it feels it felt abrupt that he, he had healed up so much. Yeah, and especially like Ann said, you you gotta you gotta relate to the line. Oh, he really did a number on you. And yeah. if it doesn't look like he did a number on you, then what's the point of the line? So. Hector, Hector is so reasonable here, uh, which surprises me because uh, 
thinking back to Breaking Bad when you saw Walking Tio, he was he was as nasty a badass a, as we've ever seen. A real mother. And so you, you know that's kind of in reserve if, if you've watched Breaking Bad and you're thinking about it. And if you haven't watched Breaking Bad, you are in for, uh, well... Yeah, I guess this whole thing was a spoiler. What would you say? <laughs> but, you know what? That's no offense. That's on you. But it, but it, you got a lot to look forward to if you haven't seen Breaking oh, yeah. Bad. Great job, John. Great job, Ann. Great job, everybody. What Thank a beautiful you. episode. This, and this, this last Mike's shot. Look. This is so great. Nice. What he does with his face. Yeah. It's great. It goes by so quickly. I know. It does. Yeah. It, it was a blast. It was great. Well, it's great, great having you, great having you working with us again. Oh, thank great, you. Great job. Yeah, thank you, John. And great job, Anne, on your yes. first episode. Yes. Yes. Thank yes. you. Well, obviously, tremendous collaborative collaborative effort, but it was uh, it was really fun. Well, more to come, more good stuff to come. And so now we're halfway through the season, to halfway through season two. If you're listening to these in order. If you're listening to them in order, which <laughs> which right. you really ought to. You really ought to. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you next time.